It was 18th July. I remember I sat down with a few friends uh, of my wife. They were living here and I told them uh, I'm going to open a coffee shop. You know, if you want to learn it to swim, learning techniques is nothing if you don't jump in the water. Every time I think about it, I say how crazy I was. So I gave him the money. I remember like giving him the money and uh, I remember that night he sent me a message and say, so we are 50-50% uh, owners of, of the company. We need to grow this chain between uh, coffee farmers and specialty coffee shops. As you grow the markets, more people will get the benefits of being well paid at the farms, being fair paid at the farms. Our eating habits are changing. We're demanding better dining experiences and the food market has never been so competitive. Starting and succeeding with a food business is challenging, but some determined and passionate entrepreneurs are flourishing. These people have big dreams, big passion and big drive. They are disruptors, change makers and innovators. They see a positive future. Many say that food business is too risky. Some say that it has huge rewards. Are you up for the challenge? Fabio Ferreira launched Notes Coffee in London after a chance meeting with his co-founder Rob at a street food market in Victoria. Ten sites later, they've now built a phenomenal brand. They've got lots of following and they've recently grown an online side to the business. I had a really interesting conversation with Fabio. He's some very insightful comments and opinions from everything from farm, um, dealing with farmers and the right approach to do so in a sustainable way, all the way through to the consumer, um, consumer tastes, consumer palates, and the way uh, the palate is changing um, through the times. So I really enjoyed the interview. Hope you do too. Sit back and enjoy. This is Food Motion. I am Peter Faro. My guest today is Fabio Ferreira, the co-founder and director of Notes Coffee Roasters and Wine Bars. After winning a prestigious Brazilian barista championship in 2007, you soon started to trade from a coffee cart at a cobbled street market in London. You now roast your own single origin coffee and serve over 6,000 cups of coffee per day across 10 locations, and you continue to be co-owner of that very first coffee cart business at Stratton Ground, Victoria. You crowdfunded in 2018, raising 1.2 million pounds for notes, and in doing so, achieved almost twice the initial target. Notes were also recently voted best Brazilian specialty coffee at the 2019 International Coffee Day. Fabio, welcome to Food Motion. Thank you, thank you for having me. Great to have you here. So, um, I know you're in London now, 10 years or over 10 years. Uh, 12 years, yeah. 12 years, very good. And I hear you didn't speak English <laughs> when you arrived in London. No, at all, uh, no how, words. How was that experience? Uh, yeah, it was, it was weird. Actually, when I came to London, I had, um, I could like write and read English, but speaking English was, uh, it's very difficult, especially to understand people. Uh, I could not understand a word people were talking to me. Uh, so it was like, it was hard at the first probably three months. Uh, but I can, I only speak something in, and it could be like in a conversation after a year living. I was studying all the time, but it, it made me very easy after one year living in England. Okay, interesting experience. So yes. And how did you, I guess, communicate on a day-to-day basis? How did you get out there? And, and well, there's, there is a thing that 68% of the communication of human beings is not speaking. So you can always like find a way to understand each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, w what was more interesting, my first, uh, not my first, but my first like proper work experience in London um, was in a, in a restaurant, a chain, um, which I was working in a coffee bar and I was the only person that could not speak English and I was the one person that trained everyone as a barista wow. because I was the only person with experience uh, in coffee which was very interesting, uh, you know, it's like the, the language barrier wasn't a problem okay. 
uh, even to to teach other people. Sure, very good. Um, and I know you were in the pharmaceutical industry before getting into yeah. coffee. Um, when did your passion for coffee start? Was it whilst working there or did, was it uh, at a younger age you developed your, your passion? No, I actually, I came, I came from a family of coffee farmers from both sides, my mom and my dad. By the time I was born, they, were not, they didn't have more farms anymore in Brazil, but I had all the, the heritage and the stories with my uncles and aunts and my uh, grandparents. Uh, so, but I didn't like coffee either way. Coffee wasn't my thing. But I was always like a kind of a foodie person. So I, in 2003, I made like a, a sommelier course because I was really into wine. And in 2004, 2005, I decided to, uh, to do a, a trip to Europe. And London was the place I, I spent more time. I loved London. And that was the first time I heard the word barista. Uh, I, I came across a friend of mine which presented me to a cafe they had like people which they they knew what they were doing is like the person that was behind the coffee machine had some knowledge and to me as a, just a, a known coffee consumer it's like it was a bit weird you know it's like it, to me it was like pressing buttons uh, behind the coffee machine and you could get like the coffee ready uh, so being like a foodie person, when I went back to Brazil, I decided to, to look into it and what coffee exactly means and, and, uh, and looking back to my heritage. So I did like a barista course in Brazil and for the first time I tried the specialty coffee. It was really obvious why I didn't like coffee before. So my experience with coffee was with a commercial coffee, commodity coffee, which uh, they are it is a drink with a very low quality once i tried something much higher quality i just like say this is different and from that point i started studying coffee and getting into it okay interesting and were you always entrepreneurial as well alongside that or what was your first memory being entrepreneurial oh that's that's <laughs> that's a way back i was um when i was 15 years old uh, my cousin and I tried to buy a pizza place in Brazil and I was stopped by, by my dad. Uh, I had some savings and, uh, and we were, my cousin was like a, a, a guy, he was like 19 years old at the time. So he was looking into the bank to get like some, uh, some loans. And uh, we had like several meetings with the owner of this, uh, this it was a pizza delivery place. And we were like very close to close the deal, but then it was uh, abruptly interrupted by my, by my dad, uh, which was, I it was always like, I, since I was like a, a, a child, my, my memory of doing things was always like trying to, to make money out of everything. So I would like go to my, my grandmother's houses and take everything she had that was old and sell for you know vintage shops uh, around and uh, I was doing that all the time and my dad had like a farm and I would like bring everything from his farm and sell to my friends uh, including like you know uh, fish little fishes and all kind of all kind of things so it, it was it comes from long time ago but probably this is because of my dad my dad is an entrepreneur so and I always mirror him to to do the same and since I'm, well, I was little I was trying to do some kind of business and uh, when I grown up went to college I ended up in pharmaceutical companies um, being a sales representative um, which was amazing experience but I was like dying to leave the place because I in my in my in my mind I could do better by myself I always had like this uh, if it was me doing this I would be doing in a different way and it would be better. Sure. Uh, and I think that was, that was uh, making me not be comfortable in the job I had, even though it was like a well-paid job, I, I was never comfortable. Sure. To me, it wasn't about like the, 
how comfortable the job and the money I was doing, but it's like how I could achieve it by myself. Sure. And I guess you had that entrepreneurial fire burning within you. Yes. You to kind of do something for yourself. Yes. Yeah. So what inspired you then to launch Notes or to, to start a business in the first place? Working in the so when I left the when I came to London uh, 2004 2005 that I did all this uh, trip around Europe and London was the place I spent more time uh, I I decided that I could like spend few years of my life living here to learn English because you know I, I was studying English in Brazil but wasn't going anywhere I could read I could write I couldn't speak uh, so at the time I was married already and my wife, uh, she's half Brazilian, half Italian. And she said, well, we could come here and, you know, live legally in the country and study English for two years and come back. So when I came to London in 2007, uh, it was 18th July. I remember I sat down with few friends uh, of my wife. They were living here and I told them... Uh, I'm going to open a coffee shop. I say that in the first day and everyone look at me and say, you're crazy. You don't know how difficult it's to run a business in England. The rents are super expensive. Uh, you know, it's like uh, things are not like Brazil. It's much more complicated. You know, you need license. You need so many things. And I say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do this. And from the first day I was here, I decided I would open a coffee shop. And I pursued this till I got it. Okay, very good. Um, and what challenges did you have then in, in that opening process, in the start of the process? Well, the challenges were always the language barrier was the first one, obviously, because even though I was, uh, when I, I put this in my mind, but I need to go to work. So I went to work to fill uh, chains. And I used the chains for my own personal research. So I used to work then and see what was the, what what was English people like about coffee. You know, which coffee they order more. Uh, what what was the feeling around it? As such, I was looking into how could I set up a coffee bar. So I would make notes of every single piece of furniture or equipment those bars had. And, and looking into the, the suppliers and everything. Working as a simple barista on minimum wage, I was like daily making notes of everything possible I could learn. You know, not, not only behind the bar equipment, but always like how works management, how, how does it work with, with the, the people that works for the company. I was looking to everything, paying attention on, on, on everything. The transition was very difficult as the language barrier to find how I could start it. Um, and yeah, it, I think that was the main one. Okay. So it sounds like you followed a very structured, considered process to, to launching. Yes. I guess with your partner, it was quite a chance encounter. Yeah. At the market stall, you just came into contact with them. How it, does that happen and how did you hit it off, I suppose? And how did you know that that relationship could flourish and had potential? Uh, in the market, wh when I when I started um, uh, when I was working uh, at Carluchos, um, I I was start looking. I wasn't happy there because it wasn't a great experience for me. Not for the company. The company is really good, but for uh, the people who are working, uh, the team I was working with, it wasn't the the most prestigious, you know, team I work at. Uh, and uh, I decided that I, I need to give the first step. So the first step for me was like, I'm going to open my own company without anything, you know, just going and open it. And because I need to give the, the first step. I always say, you know, if you want to learn it to swim, it, it, learning techniques is nothing if you don't jump in the water. You need to do, you know, you need to go inside and see at yourself if you if how how long you can you can swim uh, that's exactly what I did so I opening I opened my first company and uh, I was trying to understand how the whole bureaucracy uh, work it and I, I got like 
it was the first hit I get. It was so complicated to understand. And, you know, using an icon and it was super expensive. And I was like, oh my God, that's a bit difficult. The day I was going back home, I decided to change my way home. And I met a guy in a market doing coffee uh, in Stroton Grounds. And uh, I looked at the setup he had, his coffee van it was amazing. When I talked to him, he didn't say much about coffee. He was like just a guy that brought uh, a coffee from uh, a coffee brand from Paris. And because he worked it there for this company and he, he saw the successful business they were doing and he wants to bring the concept to London. But he didn't know anything about the product. So talking to him for like five to ten minutes, I, I just like start, you know, there's so many things you can improve. After the day, I went there a few more days and they were always talking. So I teach him how to improve the quality of his coffee. I, I taught him how to improve the quality of his milk. And, and he saw the difference when he was using the, you know, the, the, uh, the concept I, I showed him and he said that, you know, the customer was feeling the difference. And it then started my relationship uh, with uh, Robert Robinson, which is my business partner in the coffee cart and in notes as well. And he asked me to, one day he called me and said, listen, um, I do want to do some shifts here. So I went there did some shifts uh, for him, uh, enjoy working there, and uh, he get a very good feedback from uh, from his customers, saying, you know, the guy that worked here that day, well, he was really amazing, I had like very good coffee out of him. So he called me back again and say, I know you are very unhappy at, at, at the company we're working, would you like to come and, and work for, for me? And I said, no, I don't. It's just like, uh, to me, you'll be changing, you know, six for half a dozen. It's the same thing. Mm. You know, it's like, uh, I'm going to be still working for someone. I don't want to this. Mm. To me, I need to have my own, my, my own business. And working for you, I could like see, I got like in contact with the company that does your, your van. I got a meeting with them. I saw how much it costs to do that. And he was like, okay. Uh, he was a bit disappointed. He wasn't expecting me to turn down his offer. And uh, like a week or two weeks later, he called me back again and said, oh, you know, what? I have another proposal for you. I'm going to do my master's and I need someone here at full time working the, in the coffee van. So maybe instead of you coming to work for me, you could become like my business partner. Okay. So he said that was the ice paint uh, just under 8,000 pounds to set up this business. The van is not mine, the van belongs to the guys in Paris. And uh, we pay, I pay a rent for them, but I need to buy this van in a couple of years. So you can come, give him half of the money, and we do 50-50%. So I did this, I give him, I literally give him the money. And the only thing I knew about him was his mobile phone. Okay. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't, didn't know where he lives or anything, which was like really slight risk. <laughs> exactly. Every time I think about it, say how crazy I was. So I gave him the money. I remember like giving him the money, and uh, I remember that night he sent me a message and say, "I just like uh, put our partnership up." So you can see in the HMRC is like it's all done. So we are uh, 50 50 percent owners of of the company. So that's how we started. Okay. And you think when you first came across him, so you first approached that store, you think subconsciously you were looking for a partner? No, you were attracted to him or I was attracted by his business because uh, okay. what he brought to London was exactly the same thing I wanted to do. I f when, I, when I looked for the accountants and looked at all the bureaucracy to open a cafe was huge and risk and expensive. I thought that's not the way forward and I was I always saw all those markets around in London and I say that's the place to start you know just have like a cough stall and that's how I'm going to start it because at the time uh Mungmouth coffee had a coffee stall inside the borough market 
and it was like th they have their shop there which is huge and it's super busy and the coffee store was the same and i said that's i need to get to a place like that sure. so it was like that motivation was like look into his business and seeing the opportunity to i can maybe i can do this the same so that's that's the reason I talked to him because I see the quality of the coffee machine he was using. It's like there are some, you know, there is so many coffee machine brands. But in specialty coffee, you know, you'll be like, you know, two or three, they are the most popular ones using. And he had one of those very popular coffee machines in specialty coffee. It's like, this guy is different. And what made me stop there was exactly looking to his business. Uh, nothing, and then I just start the conversation. So notes have obviously done very well and since you've uh, launched and you're averaging 30% sales um, growth year on year, it's phenomenal. How do you manage that growth, I guess, operationally and from a business level? And even in terms of your own role yourself, how have you transitioned from, I guess, being very hands-on for the first few sites to now, I guess, pulling yourself upwards and then running the business? Uh, I t not really. You are still very hands-on on everything, so I, I, it's, it's very difficult for me to define my my role in the business. I'm a little bit away from the shops at the moment because I need to focus more in the coffee roastery. Uh, notes not only supply coffees for itself, uh, we also supply coffee for other companies uh, too, which which nowadays is. It's half of the coffee you are roasting goes to another companies, um, and so I, I manage my time 100% in the coffee roastery, and it traveling around the world buying uh, green coffee. So 90% of the coffee that we bring into the country, we direct the trade uh, with the farms and cooperatives and exporters in different countries. Um, so it's yeah, and. Beside this, I, I'm part of all the meetings that we need to discuss shops. So we have like, you know, every week we look into like the, the growth of the company, some things, some problems is happening. But uh, Notes has four working directors and the, the four working directors, uh, three of them are um, the co-founders and we are super hands-on. So also to try to minimize the central causes of the company. As well, so I think we do more than we're supposed to do. Okay, and you do have some central roles in place, I guess. Yeah, we do. We so do. How did you know when the right time was to hire them people? Well, we, funnily enough, uh, the central roles, uh, uh, we yeah, w when we start growing, we, we we saw in some areas we need like people to be dedicated on that. So that's one when we started. It's all about how much we can handle and how much uh, efficient we are doing uh, everything and when we need someone else. But it's everything has, we need to look how much the company, uh, the revenue of the company and the BTDA of the company, because it's like when you hire some professional, it's gonna hit hard your, you know, mm. your BTDA, because sometimes you are hiring someone that's not gonna give you more business. You know, it's gonna probably take things out of our hands mm. or make something more efficient, but it doesn't mean we're gonna like sell more. Uh, and we know that it's gonna come off somewhere and it's gonna come off a phone from the profits the company is making. So ev every decision has to be, uh, we need to architect every decision to see if it's worth it doing or not. Okay, and I guess when you get to, let's say three, four and beyond sites, how are you managing um, or ensuring that the consistency of the standard is maintained and it is consistent across every single site? Yeah, is that it, a challenge? Or? Yeah, it is very challenge. Yeah. It's a massive challenge. I think when we had like one, two shops, um, it was much easier because also because that time it had very little places where specialty coffee were around. So it was easier uh, to hire people that was really interested in what they were doing. And nowadays it's completely difficult to hire uh, baristas that are interested in the product. They are very like, um, uh, how can I say, they, they are very competent on the job, on the day-to-day -day job, you know? 
they can they can perform really well but with less knowledge mm. before we had more people with more knowledge but you know i guess it's in, in every new area that opens up in the market it, it happens that you have too many people that knows quite a lot and then as as it grow it it spreads a little bit more sure. and those people from the beginning they are all like in good positions in different companies or inside <coughs> notes and uh yes it, it is it is challenging to to keep the standards but it's very possible okay. you know we have done it we have probably around 120 staffs and notes at the moment and uh we w you know whatever you go at notes you always having like a same quality coffee sure okay and in terms of the coffee itself and attracting the market and a specific market in london how do you decide firstly what beans to select and then the roasting style of that coffee as well is it a personal subjective decision on your part or it is both okay. it is personal and it is uh, how the market trains sure and it's trying to understand the um, uh, the customer as well mm. so when we when i work it behind uh the coffee carts in certain grounds and when i opened the first notes i was always behind the counter talking to people uh, we have phases which were a little bit more pretentious around what you were selling and and being a bit you know like not very nice with customers and not giving what they want just like providing them what you want them to have it mm. which was like a it was a mistake mm. uh sometimes you need you need to easy things uh down with customers so they can start uh getting the knowledge is one of the things i learned at the working notes was like we can never lecture a person over the counter you know try uh, to show them how things are done is because coffee is a habit people just want to come in and be uh have like a very good service where you know you smile you take their money give their coffee and they leave the place happy you know it's uh and they the customer will recognize that the, the drink he is having has more quality than the other one he had in one of the big chains or somewhere else and he will come back you know and he will create the habit and then uh time by time he's going to start learning more about the coffee so the way i i start doing it was there is my personal style which is using like a coffee roasting which is not dark is more uh, for light um, a light side which gives the coffee more character uh, acidity uh, more sweetness it's it's a coffee really really interesting it makes like a coffee with milk or alternative milk super sweet um, there was a, a decision that we made at the beginning before we start roasting coffee and and we kept doing it and people who understand this now you know customer understands about light roasting versus dark roasting and there is nothing wrong when people like dark roasting you know we have plenty of places which they offer dark roasts where people can have their coffee uh, my preference for to drink is always going to be like the light roast because it is a much more delicious drink uh, then when i choose the beans i start like going all over the place i like like coffee is super acidic and i realize customer they don't understand acidity mm. you know in coffee they can understand in wine like when mm. when they drink wine they they love having like a pinot gris or a pinot grigio which is they are wines with high acidity but in coffee they don't they just like something very sweet and mellow so i when i recognize this i say oh, you know what i'm gonna base it the coffees for espresso in coffee that's a super sweet and with low acidity so i have been doing that okay. since then so this is uh, going against your personal preference almost it is yeah. it is going against my pers personal preference although there is a time of the year which i bring the coffees from ethiopia and the coffees from Ethiopia, they are very fruity. Mm. They are super acidic. And I try to find coffees which qualify more to our standards from Ethiopia because I just love them. And sometimes I buy small lots with coffees that are more acidic. And they are delicious. They are amazing. But some people complain about them. 
that's how I prefer the you know the previous coffee I had here, which was like a Brazil or a Colombian coffee or a Guatemalan coffee, which they are more uh, today standards that we are working at the moment. So yes, uh, I I try to listen to the customer, and you know time by time I put <coughs> something different uh, because we change the espresso all the time at notes, uh, but trying to keep on the same on the same standards in terms of like. Uh, what you are are tasting it's not going to be like something very different okay and i guess the consumer palette is constantly changing do you see the the mass market palette continuing to move towards the acidic range yeah or yeah you do? it is okay. for sure okay it is for sure because even the coffees that for me is low acidity for some people that were having coffees commercial coffees for them is high acidity okay you know, they, they they feel this but the transition has happened. The the the, palette, the the consumer palette has changed quite a lot. Okay. And it, it will change, and we will phasing up for coffees more acidic as as people move more towards this. Sure. Okay. Very good. I want to talk about um, I guess the different purchasing channels that have come on stream over the last few years. So in particular, online ordering. Yeah. Um, so subscription models, um, coffee capsules, etc. I know you've moved into that space. Um, in addition to click and collect as well, yeah. another, another um, type of purchasing. Um, how have you found that and how have you transitioned to focus more on that side of the business? Um, yeah, the, the web shop, it's, um, we, we look at two competitors which they are very successful on, on web shop and uh, the revenue they are doing, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's very envy, you know, it's like how they have grown their business on online experience but also the online experience uh, we need to understand is a huge investment because you have it to treat <coughs> the online web shop as a physical web shop which is difficult because mm -hmm. you know the physical you have like the you know the the the, the, the footfall you have like the people coming in and out you, you you have like so many variables that you can see when you have the web shop you don't you know, you you be like, you be like relying on uh, Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and your our comp our uh, way to to put notes out there. Uh, so when we start the web shop, we started the very in-house thing. We just like uh, had like a very simple website, and we put like a web shop there, and organically we start selling. Uh, it started getting like out of hand because we were not selling a huge amount, but it was enough to take one and a half a day of the people in the roastery to deal with it. You know, roasting the coffees, posting, doing all the, the paperwork and uh, doing the system, which was nothing uh, created. It was like a very spreadsheets and, you know, doing the, you know, which coffee has have we sent to these customers and it was a kind of huge work so recently uh, we decided to move on from this so we have approached it by a company which they uh, they are specialized in, in e-commerce and they took our web shop out of our hands so they deal with everything so it's like our web shop is it's the notes web shop but we treat them as our uh, wholesale customer so we supply them and they distribute and they do all the 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 purchases they do everything so we saw like growth is of 200 300 percent compared wow. to last year when they were focusing in in selling coffees through the web shop so now they are doing lots of experiences they are using our mailing lists uh and the next year we have lots of actions to improve even more uh, but yeah, it's uh, but they are treating the place as a physical store, so they have the people behind it and 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 more more people to look into it. Okay. So yeah, the web shop is necessary. Yeah. Uh, for every company out there, they need to have like presence on the on the digital online stores because it's you know it's the way the world is the way the world. Yeah, everyone yeah. is moving. Uh, every way is moving to you know ordering things online. Sure. You know? So are you seeing some of your uh, customers who used to come into the physical shops move to an online purchasing right I'm now? I'm happy or? for them to move it to online you purchasing. You are? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because uh, I think uh, in the coffee shops, 
where we are, mainly in the city, uh, is an opportunity for you to come and buy like a coffee capsule or a bag of coffee uh, because it's there so you can take and take it home. It's, it's our local uh, coffee shop during the week and you know on the weekend that you move away from from the city you can have a very cup of nice coffee but on the same way uh, you can do it online and do subscriptions that you don't need to worry more about it you know you know the coffee is going to be there every week or you know you can tell a friends and uh, it's for us it's really it's really nice for them to move and we think online we can we push more because you know we send emails you remind of offers at the bar it's difficult to pollute the bar with offers on on the retail sure you cannot like create posters for retail when you need to mark up the shop for the evening offer we have or for the new coffee we have or for the teas we have so it's like we cannot have so much communication in the shop because it gets really confused. Mm. So it's like the 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 retail is the one that suffers more inside inside our stores mm. because it's we we are not doing like anything to to promote it on on the web shop is dedicated to that. Sure. So when the customer comes and buy in his own the emails, he's gonna receive the offers, he's gonna be part of the club, he's gonna get like offers that if he's a sub subscription customer, it, it is a much better uh, way to do it. Okay. So we were very happy for them to move to online to online purchasing. Okay. And with more people purchasing online in general these days for all products, essentially, um, you've obviously noticed restaurants and the high street in general is struggling to, to an extent. Lots of kind of high profile closures. Um, have you been impacted by that as well? Or how have you dealt uh, with that? Not really. We found it very difficult for, for example, to do deliveries of coffee. It's almost like no one has created a formula that it can deliver coffee, you know, uh, unless it's very close to the coffee shops. Uh, and also the coffee shop, it's, um, it's a place where people want to come uh, to get off to get out of the office mm. for a few minutes is kind of a peace of mind for them uh, it is a destination for people on an everyday basis uh, I can see why some restaurants are suffering uh, because today you know the online food and you know some somewhere else kitchens which they can provide like good quality food are are, are very popular and getting high high and high yeah, but I don't think that's happening with coffee. Okay, interesting. Um, and I know you're not just selling coffee, you have an extended food range and beer, and now you're kind of targeting the nighttime trade as well. Yeah. How has that worked as a strategy? Yeah, I think we were the, the f I'm not gonna say the first, because I'm sure lots of you know, uh, coffee shops out there were doing that already, but for a specialty coffee shop, I think you were the first uh, to start doing it. Okay. Uh, and the reason was when we opened our first <coughs> shop, which was next to uh, English National Opera House in St. Martin's Lane, it's a high street, it's high rents. So we have, we, we had like a location which we can uh, do business up to 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, so how can you use the, the space better? Mm. It's the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the question was, simple and and the response are even simple it's like using alcohol you know because it's like that what people are looking for the evening we're still gonna have like the our main product which is coffee and it's, it was impossible <coughs> to find high quality coffee at the time of the day after like five six o'clock in the afternoon we could not find anywhere but you could go to notes at seven eight nine o'clock in the evening and and have a very nice cup of coffee but also we can have like a cup of wines which you know very nice wines and people will be more you, you can bring groups together okay so we need to find ways to optimize uh the business through the day to justify the locations you were having okay so that was was a was was a simple um simple solution uh doing that right was really difficult you know i think we did we got to a place that we did it right but it was extremely difficult because in our minds it was we don't want to become one bar one you know 
all bar one which they came with the concept of having like breakfast lunch uh pub wine bar trying to be everything to everybody yes mm. we so, do, you don't want to do this we mm. don't want to like people we stop stop coming in the morning uh because we are serving wine mm. so we never as we serve wine after midday if you require but we will never push it mm. I guess it's challenging um, retaining a clear brand and the association with the brand. Yes. Because you're known for coffee, obviously. Yeah. So to keep that very clear for people. Yeah. But then to also associate wine or different elements that with was, it as that well. That was the it's difficult balance, part. It, it was to, to find people to switch, uh, to come to us in the evening was very difficult. Yeah. Oh, you guys do wine. Yeah, we are not pushing wine during the day or like bottles of champagne or proseccos or mm. whatever in, at lunchtime or doing any food for wine at lunchtime. No, lunchtime was purely like a coffee space. It's coffee, it's brunch, it's salad, sandwich, cakes. If you want to have a beer, we have beers in the fridge. But we are not handling like menus with the types of beers and wines we have. But when it comes like 5.30 in the afternoon, we switch the whole thing. Mm. You know, we go from like coming to the till to do your order to a table service. Uh -huh. And then we switch the the lights. The lights comes down. Uh, there is candles on the tables. And then we, we switch the, take all the cakes away, all the food on the counter away. Uh, and then we, we give you more like a, uh, a different look to the shop also the music we change completely the music it goes from you know one level to a completely different level so it's like the the whole thing we fought through I mean we didn't fought through you know one day it was like mm. learning with mistakes and trying to to get the two uh, the two type of business in balance sure without affecting each other sure so, and I think when you go to notes during the day and when you go in the, in the evening, you, you can definitely feel uh, the difference of the place you are. You feel completely like you're in a different space. Okay, interesting. So what are your plans for growth then for, for the near and, and further future? I, I hear you're, you're looking at train stations and airports as a, as a growth. Yeah, we're, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, we, are, we are going through a very interesting uh, times in in Britain with the Brexit and economically globally everywhere so we don't actually know what's happening mm. uh, we want to grow organically from now you are not looking for any crowdfunding in the future um, I think we are uh, kind of established in the market I think we are uh, I'm sure we are one of the biggest uh, specialty coffee chains in town uh, we are not you know you want to grow organically we're going to open a, a new shop in the new year in february uh, it's going to be a residential area because we need to try our model in a residential area we need to make sure that it's going to work uh, and that's very exciting we are always looking for new sites but with the whole economical problems going around we are a bit skeptical to to move forward quicker than we were that we want so it's just like waiting for what's gonna happen okay okay like the rest of the world I suppose. yes <laughs> so you mentioned crowdfunding um, there and I know you raised twice through crowdfunding uh, quite successfully um, certainly the second time at least why did you choose crowdfunding as a funding option um, and you mentioned you wouldn't do it in the future so what's driving that decision? Uh, the crowdfunding is a very interesting uh, concept, uh, which is uh, we thought you'd be much better than uh, get money out of the bank. Uh, also, we need to consider you are giving uh, the company away to another 900 people. That was like the amount of people that invested in notes. You know, we have like people investing like as little as 10 pounds and and as much as like 20 grand um, so we have all, all kind of all kind of investors which is great and uh, and for us was fine to you know uh, let go away some uh, shares of the company to those people because and we found because that uh, that was our second crowdfunding we did it to crowdfunding so we learned from the crowdfunding 
that those people they become ambassadors of the mm. of the company so they are they really take some ownership of the company and uh, they they bring people together they are you know they 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 are happy to tell their friends about notes they it's a it's a massive PR for us mm. in terms of like spread the word of the company. So we found the crown fund very positive in terms of growth. So it's like um, it's a it's a valuation that's very good that was done by by the company uh, for the people that are investing. They they are having a return on the investment as well. And of course, it's a, it's an investment at risk, but you know. It is a very interesting model how to invest uh, your savings if you have, you know. Sure. So why wouldn't you do it in the future then as well? Uh, because we don't want to, I think we we are, we stop it with like giving away the shares of the company. Ah. We don't want to dilute anymore. Okay. In the, the working directors and the investors of notes, we don't want to dilute. Okay, makes sense. And in terms of, I guess, building your brand um, over the years and into the future, what is your strategy to do that? Are you focused more on social media or PR or, or how do you build that brand? Well, that's uh, social media is being something that we always been going, going around and talking about. Uh, it's crazy how it has changed everything to put the brand there. Uh, yeah, we, we invest uh, in social media, not, not as much as other competitors you uh, were always trying to look the balance out of it because it's difficult to manage the impact of s on sales of social media you know there is there is there's nothing tangible no yeah so it doesn't have like you put something up and you're gonna see the growth in the shops no it doesn't you can see maybe in the web shop if you do like an offer through the social media the end of the day when you get a report from how much you have sold of the product say okay that was social media but it's digital isn't it you see sure. something digital you go to the web shop it's much easier than uh, it's yeah it's hard but it's necessary sure so we we have like um uh, instagram a uh, twitter and uh, facebook but we are much more uh focused on the instagram uh part of the business you find uh, that's more impactful yeah because yeah. Uh, I think it, it, the pictures works really well in terms of what's happening in the shops and show the people what's going on. It's sure. more, sure. Uh, there is more impact. Okay. How do you find a way to, to stand out amongst the, the, the noise, I suppose, and your competitors? I think there's, there's around 25,000 cafes in the UK at the moment. So yeah. how do you stand out and be different in a positive light as well? It's, I think because you were, I mean, no, I think because we were one of, one of the first like mm. specialty coffee shops uh, we are respected by so many others and we are well known uh, around the city so uh, people can recognize notes uh, also uh, our shops they are in a owing the owing central London all very not not close that you can walk to each other except the coffee shops in the city there are three coffee shops that you can, it's it's a walking distance, you know, we have one in Gherkin, one in Bank, one in Morgate. So it's a walking distance one to another in, in five minutes to reach each shop. But you know, the city is like, no one w walks more than two blocks for a cup of coffee in general. Uh, so it's, those are walking distance. The other ones are all in central London. It's, it, it creates lots of visibility uh, and you know, it, 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 it marks us up very well in the city or in Canary Wharf where we have uh, three coffee shops there. So people recognize us like notes that are in three locations inside Canary Wharf and sure. say, oh, notes is, you know, is like the impact that does is, is quite good. Sure. I guess you have a level of credibility because you've been around so long as well. Yes. Yeah. Also, also the, the yes. Yeah. I agree with you. Okay, very good. It'd be good to talk about sustainability, um, and in particular for the farmers. So now their prices have been pushed downwards. Not really. Yesterday, this week went crazy. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think yesterday was in 135. Okay, interesting. It's really high. Okay. But still, as a farmer, I, I guess producing on a small scale in particular, it's quite yeah, tough. And even uh, your family had a farm. Yeah. Like that, yeah. I don't, in specific, I, 
for an old, I don't buy on. I don't follow the New York price to buy the specialty coffee. Okay. Uh, we have like standards of like how the coffee are being producing and uh, how the coffee is being scoring when we try them. And from that point that we decided uh, how to price the coffee we're buying for, uh, we also pay a minimum. Uh, that we have a minimum in our mind that we can pay for the farmer. And we don't have like limits to spending a coffee, for example. Now, we have a coffee uh, this year that we pay uh, 39 pounds per kilo, uh, which is a very special one. But we have having the, the family as coffee farmers and we understand more the farms in Brazil. Uh, I know very well the cost of production of coffee farmers. You know, <coughs> alongside big farmers, small farmers, micro farmers. And it, I always keep this in mind to do any negotiation uh, with the farmers. So it's like we will never uh, try to screw uh, the coffee farmer because of the New York price. Because we don't work on the commercial side. Okay. Uh, the coffees for notes is not on the, on the commercial side of it. So it's, 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 it's more fair play. Okay. I would say so. Sustainability always comes when the farmer are financially sustainable. If he is financially sustainable, we can ask them for sustainable work on the farming for the environment. Sure. If he is not financially sustainable, it will be impossible for him to keep going. Absolutely. So there is a massive one. Every time people tells me sustainability, the first thing that comes to my mind is the financial. Yes. It's like you cannot, you know, you cannot do something good if you are not commercially right. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll be a charity. Sure. And farmers are not charities. They are not. They use they they use the environment to do the coffee, but they need to be profitable to improve their farming. Sure. If you understand, because like if they do like organic management or if they uh, use the, the right ways to farming, it's going to cost them more. So if I'm not paying his, the right amount of money, he, he's not going to be encouraged to do it. Sure. He's just going to keep all the practices that uses lots of fertilizants, pesticides and herbicides. That's going to be much easier to farm. Mm. Uh, and that's not very good for the environment. Sure. So you really see them as part of your business, like they're a critical stakeholder in the business. Yes, so absolutely. Yeah, they are. Maintaining and looking, well. looking around. Um, we vis I visit the coffee farms and I want to <coughs> know what they are doing. Uh, yes, I want to know everything. I want to, but not only know, I, I, could, I could tell I have a little bit of experience like on, on the farm and learning quite a lot being on the fields to recognize the farms that are using herbicides or not, you know, and it, it needs to understand a little bit deep about coffee mm. to see what's going on there. Okay. So for, I guess, coffee shop owners who wouldn't have the inside knowledge that you would have about the farms, would you recommend like a, a rainforest alliance or some accreditation similar to that? to follow or what's your opinion of that in general? Oh, yeah, I th yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I think the, I think the accreditation is always come, always comes from the, um, the coffee roasters they are using. If they believe and they are seeing the work that those coffee roasters are doing from where they are buying coffee from, it's really good because sometimes <coughs> the UTZ or rainforest certifications, they are amazing, but they are not very, reachable for like a, a small farmer. So if you go to Colombia, you have farmers, they have like 5,000 coffee trees, 2,000 coffee trees. That's absolutely nothing. Mm. If we go to Myanmar, you have like people with like 15 coffee trees at the backyard, mm. which they, you know, pick up the fruits and sell to the cooperative. So those guys, they will never reach like a certification. Okay. Who's going to certify the work is like, is the coffee roastery or the coffee importer that it's working with them. You know, that's gonna be like, okay, those guys does a pretty much good work. We can assure this. Uh, so yes, yeah, certifications are great. Mm. You know, uh, Run Forest, UTZ, they are great. They, they talk about sustainability and the right practices in the, in the farms, especially in the big ones. 
but they don't cover the small small farmers okay and where do you see the future of the the growing side of the business going because obviously consumption of coffee is increasing and i yeah. think we'll continue to do so so how do you see that developing on the on the farming side you think we're going to have more farms or well it's i i mean I've, there are yes yeah. of course so uh china is um is doing coffee they are cultivating coffee they are planting and y we can find amazing coffees coming from china there are always a new country you know coming around and producing coffee and getting more knowledge so it's like uh, i don't think it, there is enough land for the growth of coffee okay uh the problem will be uh how sustainable everyone can be and is the a new york price can follow this because right now the new york price you have a turnover this week you know it was like one dollar for many months for almost a an year and now it's 135 it's just like okay it came to the level that was before which is really good but it's still under uh the how much the, the farmer spends to to produce coffee okay. so if you go to small farmers in in central america even in brazil their cost of production is going to be like uh, probably one dollar eighty. Wow! You know, when the market is one thirty five, um, and obviously this is market up because Brazil is the biggest producer of coffee in the world, and I anticipated the market going up uh, this year because you know the Brazil harvest wasn't the greatest one. Brazil had lots of problem with the climate mm. uh, last year, so they had like the coffee trees flowering seven times so it's all over the place so the quality of the beans were down and less production which happens the world has less coffee so how the market reacts the coffee goes up mm. uh that was like it was so predictable the coffee was going up in mm. some time when brazil had like the whole uh production done and say okay we didn't produce as much as we did last year and the quality is not as high as last year so now we have a problem Okay. And then the market goes up, you know, because it's like the offer you'll be, you'll be better. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's like the, I, I, I feel the New York market, the way they price it is based on Brazil only. Based on? Brazil. Okay. It's yeah. based on Brazil only because Brazil okay. has mass productions of coffee farmers. Yeah. So we have coffee farmers, they are producing 100,000 bags of coffee. You know, um, Bolivia, for example, produces... 20, 25,000 ba 20, bags of coffee per year. Okay. In Brazil, we have like hundreds of farmers that okay. produces 20,000 bags of, of coffee. Okay. That's Bolivia itself. Yeah. So Brazil is between 35 to 40% of the world production of coffee. So everything's based on the big farmers in Brazil. And, but Brazil is also 70% of the coffee farmers in Brazil, they are small farmers. Yeah. They are small families. So all those people, they suffer with the New York price. Okay. So specialty coffee doesn't look, I mean, I cannot say for the whole industry, but we would be looking more how of the quality of the coffee and the quality of production to price the coffee up rather than the New York price. Okay, so you think that's the, the better yes. approach? Yes, so it's to like this year when I bought coffee in Brazil, in Guatemala, I paid same price I paid last year, even though the market was like 30 cents down okay. Per, okay. per pound. So it didn't affect at all my relationship with the, the farmers and the exporters I'm working, I'm paying the same price. Okay, do you think the New York approach will ever change or? I mean, that's that's just the way I, they do I it. I don't think they will change. Okay. They are traders, isn't it? They yeah. they are number people. Yeah, traders are. It's very interesting going the, into the world of trader, because it's like they. I don't blame them. It's it, it is a different work. They are not the work, uh, at the origin. They work around the numbers. So they have the productions. They have the buyer. So they just connect the buyer. And it, they, they use like the, the, the commodity price to do deals. Sure. They, they, they don't have the feeling of like going to a coffee farm and see how it works. And, and we understand that 70% of the coffee farmers in Brazil, they are small farmers. You know, they understand on, on, the, on, on, 
on the on the general on the mass the broad terms yeah, yeah. yeah exactly interesting very good great um well, i'd love to finish off just by asking you a couple of questions uh, in terms of what advice would you give yourself let's say the 18 year old fabio what would you say to him now at this stage after all of your experience it's uh, uh i mean uh, it is to just look out for all the opportunities because it's like what something that i learned uh through this there is no lucky um, every time someone says you were very lucky, I, it just like upsets me a lot because mm. I, I was never lucky. I just could see the opportunities around me and someone, some of them I take, maybe lots of them pass through me and I, I could not recognize. So it's just like, listen, everyone sometimes has a crazy idea, but we should be always prepared to listen to people because from the crazy idea or the the proposal you can take something really interesting out of it so it's like it's always listen to everyone uh never be pretentious saying oh, you don't know what you were talking about it's, it, and just see the opportunities in front of you because okay. they are there okay and just soak in all of the, the knowledge yes well. exactly okay. and not, never be afraid of learning as well okay you know okay and what advice would you give people looking to get into the specialty markets in, in let's say in the uk and to open a coffee shop. Any specific advice there? Yeah, I think they sh should definitely do it. I, I, I see lots of people saying, oh, specialty coffee market is, uh, it's, 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 it's an office that are too much. No, that are not. You know, we need to grow this chain between uh, coffee farmers and specialty coffee shops. As you grow the markets, more people will get the benefits of being well paid at the farms, being fair paid at the farms. So yes, I, I always encourage people to get into your specialty coffee, for sure. Okay, very good. Oh, fantastic. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, Fabio. Yeah. A very interesting Thank you so and intriguing. Much. And well done and, and best of luck with continued yeah. success. Thank you. Thanks very much. Brilliant.